Sharon Ryan for setting the bar where it needed to be my first semester. Uh, very deep appreciation to Joan Goulahan, my thesis mentor, for her patience, encouragement, and guidance. Thanks to Stephen Kramer, Jana, and Janet for welcoming me, welcoming me into this wonderful community. To my cohort, getting to share these past two years working with so many talented writers has been a blessing. Very deep gratitude to Jen Fitzgerald for her honesty and always looking out for me. To Sherry Kaplan for her optimism and kindness. Thank you, Mary Benson, for your friendship and trusted counsel. You have been a saving grace on so many levels. I'm really proud to be in the same lineup with you today. With that, yeah. <laughs> Coming home. I reached below the sink, compared the proofs of the bottles beneath. 80 is best, and I pour the glass half full, watching the Diet Coke turn gold, beautiful as amber. I climb the stairs the way I am used to, as a child tiptoeing to my bedroom. I do not wake the man in the master bedroom, his hands gripping the bruised arms of his woman. I sleep above the shotgun my mother hid below my mattress and forgot about long ago. It waits there. No one suspects the room with the unicorn wallpaper. I'm just visiting tonight. I have the secret beneath the surface. I try not to roll over. Something might go off. Saving face. When you have dried toothpaste on your chin, I don't tell you anymore. I let you go to the office with bran between your teeth, toast crumbs on the crotch of your khakis. Sometimes I reach for you as if by impulse, then pretend to be shielding my own face from the sun. You're not any better. On our anniversary, you don't tell me I've tucked my skirt into my nylons. I have lipstick on my teeth. On my shoe, I trail along toilet paper on the way back from the bathroom. We've grown tired of looking after the smaller things, eyelashes which have fallen on one another's cheeks. We don't giggle out of embarrassment for each other anymore. I wish I could let you know your reading glasses are still on your head, silly. You run around the house slipping couch cushions and cursing at our dog for being under your feet. All the time, I whisper the old seeing eye game you used to play. Darling, you're getting cold, no colder. Even colder. You are frozen, goddammit. Why don't you look in the mirror? Self-portrait at age 79. I am so old, these birds could outlive me. I am relieved by this. Like some great weight being lifted from my chest. The one that's been bearing down on me, demanding. My only guests are goldfinches. I am not naive enough to think I own them. I unlatch their bamboo doors every morning, always honored when they stay. I comb my silver hair away from my face, still in love with my collarbone. I have a hundred plants I overwater, saying each name like a prayer, begonia, anthurium, lilium. The Tyrant. Easter morning, your grandson is beating his fists against the table, sweaty little tyrant. I propped his rotund body on one knee so he can see you press your grizzled mustache against an eggshell to teach him, as you taught me, how to blow the innards out of the ones we want to keep. You used to frighten me. You woke too early, listened to the birds, called back to them. You tried to teach me once. Old Sam Peabody, 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 who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Mm -hmm. Nonsense, I whispered, copy cutting how my mother pitched her hip when I heard her call you fascist. You were highbrow, enveloped by thick publications, always scribbling illegible things, requiring cigarette breaks and bold coffee. Nana swept ash from the floors just yesterday. We repapered the country kitchen wallpaper she fell in love with 30 years ago, kneeling side by side, tearing the roosters as you chanted in the baby's ear, Old Sam Peabody, 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 who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Such a carefully gauge whisper, gentle now, he pruned, trying to keep him. Cool shark. When the game gets too close, I call the shots out loud. We practice in a local pool hall where I'm allowed free refills of Shirley Temples and as many quarters as I can carry to the jukebox. You tell me I'm a real good shot. On weekends, we take on a team of barfly townies in some pub over the mountain. They see that pool cue towering over me. I bat my wide eyes, because you said, they figure, we'll be an easy enough steal. Then scratch on the brake, miss the first couple highballs. I warm up the way you taught me. 
Soon we bring it home, banking shots off the sides, behind our backs. I like to watch the drop jaws fall as I tighten up on these angles, begin sinking one shot after another. When I demand they pay up, fair and square, my palm looks tinier under all those greasy bills. You lean back, grinning beneath your handlebar mustache, say, girl, you done good. I want to know if winning will always be so easy. Aiming like this when I close, the other focus on a ball, some shot I was born to sink. Casanova's Breakfast. In the North End, you pay dock prices. You tap the open oysters, check if they're at their best. They must respond emphatically, feel heavy, full in your hand. When you shuck them, you take care not you when you shuck them, you take care not to spill the juices, wriggling sharp blade past hinges, severing muscle, swallowing them raw, four dozen bivalves wholly with their colorless blood. Tiny three-chambered hearts pumping, you detach belly from basin. When it's her turn, you show her how to put wide end to mouth, tip it upward, call her a natural as she grins with pride, snapping her head back, brand new but compliantly undoting. Each mouthful slips down effortlessly. A cluster of oysters is called a bed, you whisper. In times, there is no way to know which one envelops a grain of sand beneath their flesh. They're faceless, have no lips to forewarn him. He's on the verge of destroying something rare. Staring at the sun. Root yourself in heavy mulch. Sew all ten of your toes into a shallow trench and stake yourself upright. But you will never be like the sunflower. It's ornate, top-heavy bloom, face <coughs> ogling the east at sunrise. It's spiraling gaze as gaudy and brazen as a chandelier. This is my last poem. How to treat pretty things. Our first apartment was located behind a glass shop. Appropriate in hindsight. You were still blocked. <laughs> Let's start over. How to treat pretty things. Our first apartment was located behind a glass shop. Appropriate in hindsight. You were still blowing hot air into me then and holding me up to the light. Truck smelling like a salt marsh, back from Plum Island. Your first gift to me was a shell. I pressed it to my ear, heard the million waves, saw our children with tawny wet locks, freckled and coddled, cocooned by monogram beach towels. You spoke my middle name softly, Dawn, when you learned it was something that either cracks or breaks on the horizon. I began to tell stories from my childhood, leading you up and down the family staircases so you could see each awkward school picture, the chronicled collection of descending smiles. When you proposed, I didn't know which hand to put forward, so I thrust them both out, hoping you might. It was April, and I was your fool. You pulled my leg so hard it came off. When I looked in the mirror, I could see the shine had left my skin, my shadow large on the wall. One morning I woke too late, used up all the hot water. The ceilings cracked the first time I called you an asshole. I had a dream night that night that I hanged myself in the kitchen. I was a glass sun catcher in the window. You were watching me spin, the rays pouring for me. The warmth of August drew near. We spent the afternoon in our backyard, and you held a tin can full of sand and ash as I tore grass from the yard in great handfuls. I once tried to sculpt a bust of my favorite artist, and the head collapsed into itself. I saw you then, head and hands, and me smoothing coil after coil, building you a crown too heavy for your neck. Thank you.